Hello, NBC family. Grace and peace to you through God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to welcome all of you to our online worship today. Whether you're a regular member of NBC or you're just viewing for the first time, I want to encourage all of you to just worship along with us as we glorify the Lord. And you can do that right where you are. We know that even though we can't be together, that God is present with each and every one of us, no matter where we are. And so we all seek to to lift his name today. I encourage you to do that through the power of his Holy Spirit and as he leads you. Today, we're going to do something a little bit different. We've asked our youth to be a part of our service, and so they're going to be offering a prayer and some scripture reading for us today. And so before we jump into our service, we're going to turn it over to Wyatt, who's going to pray for us and ask a blessing on our service. Dear Jesus, we thank you that we are able to gather here as a body in Christ, Lord, as a church, because we know that the people in the church is what makes up the church, no matter if we're at the building or not. We ask you that pastor's sermon would put an impact on everybody, Lord, but especially the people that aren't a part of our church or that are listening right now, Lord, we ask you that... um, that we would leave this sermon, Lord, knowing something that we hadn't in the first place. In Jesus' name, amen. Before the world was made, before you spoke it to be, you were the King of kings. Yeah, you were, yeah, you were. And now you're reigning still, enthroned above all things. Angels and saints cry out. We join them as we sing glory to God. Glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Creator God, you gave me breath so I could praise your great and matchless name. All my days, all my days, so let my whole life be blazing offering a life that shouts and sings the greatness of our king glory to god glory to god glory to god forever glory to god glory to god glory to god forever so take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory take my life let it be yours take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory take my life let it be yours we sing glory to god glory to god glory to god forever glory to god Glory to God, glory to God forever. So take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life, let it be yours. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life, let it be yours. We sing glory to God. Glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. Would you continue to worship with us today as we praise God for giving us his grace and his strength day by day? Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each.
each day what he deems best Lovingly, it's part of pain and pleasure Mingling toil with peace and rest Every day the Lord himself is near me With a special mercy for each hour all my cares he fain would bear and cheer me he whose name is counselor and power the protection of his child and treasure is a charge that on himself he lay as your days your strength shall be in measure this the pledge to Help me then in every tribulation So to trust your promises, O Lord That I lose not faith's sweet consolation Offered me within your holy word Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meeting Ere to take as from a father's hand One by one the days, the moments fleeting Till I reach the promised land Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meeting Ere to take as from a father's hand One by one the days, the moments fleeting Till I reach the promised land. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of First Peter, chapter four. And we're going to be continuing in our study of the, the book of First Peter. We've been looking at this series called Hope in Exile. And Peter reminding the church as they are all spread out, he's writing to Christians in what's called the diaspora, the dispersion. They're spread out all over this place called Asia Minor, and they're, they're, they can't be together with one another, and they're in a, in a world that's hostile against them. And so Peter is writing to them, reminding them uh, of the hope that they have in Jesus Christ. That even though they may be facing difficulty, even though they may be facing a hostile world, even though the, they, they may not be able to be together, they can find hope in in Christ. And Peter also reminds him of what it means to live like a Christian, what it means to live like a follower of Christ. How we should worry about, how we should worry about living our lives in a way that is honoring and pleasing to God rather than trying to uh, you know change the culture around us rather than trying to to change other people around us. Instead, we should focus on how God has instructed us to live our lives to be one of his children, one of his followers. And so Peter is writing to these Christians reminding them of what it means to live in such a way as citizens of heaven, what it means to live as followers of Christ. He, we, we also saw last week as we looked at this first half of chapter 4, this idea of being stewards of grace. And remembering that all the gifts which God has given to us, not just financial gifts, but also our, our talents, our, our abilities, and those spiritual gifts which God has blessed us with are meant to be used. They're meant to be used for God's kingdom. And they're meant to be used together as a family. And so God calls us to come together as a family and use these gifts to lift up one another, to encourage one another, to support one another, and to ultimately to glorify God. Because remember, that is the ultimate goal. As we have looked through this this book of First Peter, as we've looked through this letter, we've seen the goal time and time again has been to bring people closer to God, to bring those that are, that are Christ followers closer to each other and to God, and to bring those who are not followers of Christ into the family of God. Well, today we're going to look at uh, the last half of chapter 4 and this idea of suffering. The sermon title for today is Suffering, Joy, and Judgment. And so we're going to look at this idea of suffering. But before we jump into our sermon, we're going to do something just a little bit different. We're going to listen as, as Evan and Katie read the scripture for us as we, before we go into this. So let's listen to them as they read. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. 
but rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it's time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner. Therefore, let who let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to faith to a faithful Creator while doing good. You know, suffering is not fun. I don't know anybody that would say that it is. I don't know anybody that would say, you know what, I, I'm hoping that when I go out here today, I'm hoping that I get to suffer a little bit. I'm hoping that I get to find something that's going to cause pain or that's going to, you know, cause me to have a bad day or I'm just going to, I, I just hope that I get to suffer. None of us, none of us, regardless of whether you're a Christian or not, none of us have ever, I, and at least if we're in our right minds, have ever said, I want to suffer today. And yet, God calls us to be, to be reminded of the fact that we shouldn't be surprised when we face suffering in our lives. Notice, as we read there, that first verse, verse 12, he says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. In other words, while, while suffering may, way it may be painful and while it may be something that we don't necessarily want to go through, we as believers should not view suffering as something that is strange or foreign. Our, and, and, and what we also need to remember as we're looking at this is that our sufferings are not something that's just accidental, that, that just, you know, surprises God or that, you know, he's not able to have control over. In fact, God actually uses suffering as a way of refining us, as a way of bringing us closer to him, as a way of actually drawing us closer to him and to each other. Suffering is not something that just, some, you know, sort of pops up. Now, Peter, uh, we've read already before that Peter identifies there are times when we suffer because of evil, the times where we, we make mistakes, we do things wrong, and we can, be, we can suffer because of those things. That is the, the consequences of our evil deeds. But there's also suffering that we may face simply for doing the right thing, for being a follower of Christ, or for, for doing the righteous thing. We will face persecution. We will face opposition. And so we should be reminded that this, we should not be, uh, uh, this shouldn't be unexpected to us. It shouldn't be something that's strange or foreign to us. And sufferings are not interfering with God's purpose in our lives. How many times have, and I can just speak for my own self, how many times I have believed that I'm following God's will and I've come up against suffering and the, the, the automatic sort of response to that is I want to go, you say, well, maybe this isn't what God wants me to do because I'm facing opposition or I'm, I'm facing suffering. Maybe God is calling me somewhere else. Maybe God is saying this to me or whatever. And so sometimes we can look at that and we can, we can try to use that as a way to get out of what God is calling us. But we shouldn't look at suffering as interfering with God's purpose for our lives. In fact, sufferings can often be part of God's purpose for our lives. Remember when we looked at this last part, or the first part of chapter 4 here, last week, we said that sometimes God calls us to suffer. Sometimes God calls us to difficulty. Sometimes God calls us to places where we're uncomfortable. And it's not because he doesn't love us. It's not because he gets some kind of joy out of seeing us in pain. It is not because he wants us to suffer just to suffer. It's because he has a bigger plan and we are part of that plan. And ultimately he is bringing those other people into the relationship with him. Other people into the family of God. And so he's called us to live a life where we put our own desires and our own wants aside, and sometimes that means we have to suffer persecution or opposition or hostility because of we want to follow what God has called us to do. Sometimes God calls us to suffer as a way of bringing out those things in our lives that we need to set aside. 
we as a church for the last nine, ten weeks have been, I would say, suffering. Now we haven't, obviously, we're not facing what Peter and these Christians are facing at this time. We don't have the government chasing after us trying to kill us. We don't have, you know, the, this, the, this kind of persecution, but I believe that the church has suffered during this time because we haven't, we've never faced something like this before where we've not been able to be together, where we can't be in the same room worshiping together, and now we're all in our own houses and we're watching online and we're trying to figure out how, it, how do we do this church thing and how do we keep this fellowship alive and how do we be faithful in our giving and in our, our time and our talents and all those things which God has called us to do. And so we're, we're, we're facing this suffering and then we're all of a sudden, you know, I think this is the, where we need to look at this and say, what is God teaching us through this? Maybe God is showing us the things that we have grabbed onto and said, this is church, and he's, God is showing us through this suffering, you know what, those things aren't as necessary as we thought they were. The building, the, the pews, the, the, the hymnals, the, 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 the musical instruments, all these different things that we've attached ourselves to. And I'm not saying that any of those things are bad in and of themselves. But when we allow them to become idols in our hearts, when we allow them to, to be that thing which represents church to us, and all of a sudden they're taken away, now we're faced with where, where is my identity? Is it in those items? Is my identity in the building? Is my identity in the pew? Is my identity in the hymnal? Is, if your identity is in any of those things, believe me, the Bible tells us that those things can be taken away in a moment. But when we face suffering, if our identity is in Christ, when we're in a position where we can't be together, when we're in a position where we can't, fa we can't worship face to face, where we can't be in the building, where we can't, hold the hymnals in our hands where we can't sit in the pews. If our identity is in Christ, those things don't matter. And so we, we look and we recognize that sometimes God calls us to suffering as a way of teaching us those things which are not as significant as we once thought they were. And so Peter is urging Christians to not, not to seek suffering. I don't want you to, to think that Peter is urging Christians to, to look forward to suffering or to, you know, to, to seek it out. He's not, and again, we've said this, no one in this room and no one watching online would say that, you know, suffering is fun, that I want to suffer. Instead, he's saying, but when we are suffering, we can find joy in that suffering. In fact, look at verse 13. He says, but rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Peter says rejoice in your suffering. It is not, it is not, not, again, not saying you should seek out suffering, that suffering is somehow fun, but he is saying that we can find joy in our suffering. Why is that? Well, joy comes or joy occurs when our pain drives us to dependence on God. Joy occurs when our pain, our suffering, our hardship, our opposition drives us closer to God. That's when joy appears. That's when joy occurs. It is not, it is not we, we, we look at the situation and say, man, I'm so glad I get to suffer today. It's not that we look at the situation and we say, man, I'm glad that X, Y, and Z happened. We look at this situation and we can be honest with God. We can say, Lord, I'm suffering. Lord, I am hurting. Lord, I am in need of your help. And that is where we find joy because that is where we begin to depend on God. That is where we begin to drive closer and deeper into him. And so when we face those difficult times, we can find joy because we know that God is right there with us. Not only that, but as we suffer, we recognize that Christ himself suffered. And clearly Peter is calling these Christians to suffer for being a Christian, calling them to suffer for doing the right things. And so when we do that, if we're able to suffer during this time, then we know that we'll, we can trust and have hope in the fact that we will rejoice and be glad when that day comes when the Lord returns. If we're able to find joy in suffering now, imagine how great it will be with the joy that we will have in the glory of God when Jesus returns. So what Peter is calling to us to do is to look forward to the future. Now, don't not just overlook the things that are going on around you, but, but have your eyes set on the goal. Recognize that we are going to face difficulty in our life, but if we can find joy in our trials, and we do that by depending on God, 
then when the, when the day comes that Jesus Christ returns, that joy is going to be so much greater as we look to that day when he comes. And so we have suffering, but we can find joy in our suffering, and our joy occurs when our pain drives us to depend on God. Verse 14, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Now, what Peter is talking about here, that word insulted, it probably means slandered. And, and we, we've talked about a little bit about this where, you know, in the time when Peter is writing to these Christians, the, the world around them began to persecute Christians. Nero was persecuting Christians especially. And so, you know, the idea was that when, the, for the Romans especially, they were worshiping the emperor. And Christians, obviously, they were not going to worship the emperor. They can only worship God. And so they're not about to, to worship the emperor as a god. And, and they were not about to partake in a lot of these immoral practices that the rest of the world was doing. And so because of that, th those people following those things looked at Christians as traitors. And so they might even slander Christians this way. They say, you are a traitor because you don't worship the emperor. You're a traitor because you don't participate in the things that the rest of the country participates in. You must be, you must not love your country. You must not uh, be a good Roman or you must not love the emperor. And so all these things were being said about these Christians just for them living their lives the way that Christ had called them to live. And so what's going on here, what Peter is saying is, look, when you're insulted, when you're slandered, when people say things about you that you know is not true, you are blessed. And you might say, well, what in the world? Why, why would you consider that to be blessed? Well, notice what Peter says to them. You're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Notice that Peter says it's, it's not, the blessing is not financial. The blessing is not material. The blessing is not something that they can necessarily hold in their hands. But he's saying you're blessed because God's spirit rests upon you. The Holy Spirit living inside of each and every one of us as Christians, as, as followers of Christ. Because of that, it doesn't matter what we go through. It doesn't matter what people might say. It doesn't matter what the world around us looks like. If we have God's Spirit living inside of us, that is where we find our hope and our identity and our rest. And so Peter is saying, you're blessed because you have something the rest of the world doesn't have. You're blessed because you have the very power of God living inside of you. You're blessed because you have access to the throne of grace because the Spirit lives inside you. You're blessed because you, you have God's peace living inside of you. You're blessed because you have God's grace and mercy extended to you because the Spirit lives inside you. You're blessed because God goes with you everywhere you go because His Spirit lives inside you. It rests upon you. The indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in every believer of Jesus Christ. And so no matter what the world may say, no matter what people may, may throw at you, no matter how they may accuse you, no matter how, what they might say about you, even no matter what the words they may use, if our hope is in Jesus Christ, we can be blessed because God's Spirit lives inside us. And so he goes on there in verse 15, But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Now, I'll point out very quickly that the word Christian there in verse 16, that is one of three times in the entire New Testament where that word is used. And every time it is referring back to this this word that they began to call these followers of Christ. It, Christian simply means follower of Christ. It was, it was a term used, it was meant to be uh, maligning. It was meant to be uh, uh, something that they were talking bad about them, like, oh look, there goes those Christians. It wasn't something that they came up, they said, you know, they got together and said, hey, you know what, what, what should we call ourselves? I know, let's call ourselves Christians. That's, it's not how they came up with this name. This was actually a, a term that was used to make fun of them. And so what Peter is saying when he uses this term, he's saying, look, don't, don't suffer because of him being a murderer or an evildoer or a thief or a meddler, but suffer as a Christian. If you're going to suffer, let it be. Let them call you a Christian. Let them make fun of you. Let them say those bad things about you. Let them say whatever they want and let that be the reason that you suffer and not because you've fallen into the way of the world and done all these other terrible things. 
notice the word, and the one word that really stuck out to me as I was reading through this, the idea of this meddler. If you have a, a King James, it says a busybody. And I know for a lot of us, that's a word that we usually, we typically use to refer to like little old ladies that, that you know, talk on the phone and gossip all the time about everybody around them. Or, you know, they're always, they're like looking out their window at their neighbors or whatever. It doesn't have to be ladies, I'm just picking on them, but... You know, we use that word to mean certain things. We have that certain connotation of what it means. But in this particular example, when we see this, this meddler, this busybody, is on the same level as a murderer and a thief. And for all of us as Christians today, even we would look at this and say, well, hold on a second. You know, I'm certainly not a murderer and I'm certainly not a thief. Uh, but why is meddler, why is busybody on that same level? I mean, I would, if, if I was going to put somebody in jail, it would be the murderer, not the busybody. If I was going to call somebody a sinner, it would be the murderer or the thief, not the busybody. But what Peter is recognizing here is, look, even, and then if you look in the Greek, there really is before that, it says, even as a meddler. And so what he is saying here is, don't allow yourself even to that level. To be that person that's got to be in everybody's business. To be that person that, that's always going around causing trouble. That's stirring up arguments or, or, or you know, have, trying to just got to make your point known or whatever it may be. I and mean, we've got enough of those people out there in the world. We don't need Christians doing the same thing. And unfortunately, the world is set up in such a way, especially today, that we can fall way too easily into this. You know, the internet has provided a number of ways for us to stay connected. And praise God, through the internet, we're able to produce a video and, and, and have an online service and, and put it out there for the world to see. And so all of our church, even though they can't be together, we can, be to, we can worship together. But the internet has also opened up doors for people to, to, to talk bad about all kinds of things that they would have otherwise never have seen or known about. The internet has opened up ways for us to simply, to, to virtually open our mouths, so to speak, to type on the internet and, and say all kinds of hurtful things. The internet has opened up its doors for us to, to make our points known, to start those arguments, to, to have, just, just to feel like we've set our peace. And Peter is saying, look, don't be a meddler. You don't got to go on there and make those comments. You don't got to go on there and, and say those things. You don't got to get involved in a lot of those things that really there is no point in doing that. See, the goal of being a Christian is not to win a Facebook war. The goal of being a Christian is not to have your point be known. The goal of being a Christian is not to change the culture around you. The goal of being a Christian is not to let everybody know how much you hate the governor. The goal of being a Christian is to focus on Jesus Christ, to look to him, to live our lives like him, to be more like him. And Peter says, don't be a murderer, don't be a thief, and don't be a meddler. If you want to suffer, suffer for being a Christian. Let people talk, let people say what they will. Let people call you whatever they want. But if, they, if the best they can do is say, there goes that Christ follower, there goes that, that holy roller, there goes that Bible believer, there goes that, that church person, if the best they can do is say that, then you are blessed. Because unfortunately, I can tell you that I'm, I'm just as guilty as the next person, and, and sometimes that's not the worst that people can say about me. We need to make sure that our lives are lived in such a way that we're not just focused on the world around us, but we're also looking into our own houses. We're looking into our own lives and we're seeing where, how can I live and be more like Christ? Why? Because we want God to be glorified. Notice at the end of verse 17 or verse 16, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name, that name of Christian, that name that was meant to make fun of people, that name that was meant to, to look down upon these people who followed Christ. He said, let God be glorified in that. Because God is not glorified in a murderer or a thief or a meddler. But God is glorified in a Christian. Verse 17, he goes on there. For, for the, it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will, be, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? You know, what Peter is, is talking about here, he's recognizing this, this judgment that is coming. 
And he's saying it is time for judgment to begin. Where does it begin? It begins in the house of God. In the household of God. It does not begin in the world. It does not begin in the culture around us. It does not begin in those people who are non-believers. It begins in the household of God. That is where judgment begins. Why? Because God is continually purifying and refining his people. This whole idea of suffering, this whole idea of persecution, this whole idea of, of facing hostility is meant to make us more and more like Christ. God uses these moments, these times of suffering, these times of pain, these times of hardship to purify us like a refiner's fire and to make us more refined day by day. And we can look and when, the, when judgment comes and when we, we stand before Christ and, and we can boldly claim the blood of Jesus Christ applied to us and, and our sins have been forgiven, our outcome of our judgment will be glorious. But what about those who do not believe in the gospel, those who do not obey the word of God, those who do not follow Christ? What will be their outcome? We know the Bible tells us that all those who have rejected Christ will find their place in hell. And so these verses, these Verses of scripture, if nothing else, they should, they should point out the urgency of our need to share the gospel. Because God is ready to judge. Peter told us that when we looked last week in the first part of chapter 4. God is ready to judge. It could come at any moment, at any time, unexpected. What does that mean for you and I as a Christian? That we can't just stand back and say, Lord Jesus, please come quickly. We've got to get out there. We've got to be out in the world. We've got to be sharing the gospel. We've got to be proclaiming the glory of, of God. We've got to be sharing the good news with people because time is short. Because the, the end is at hand. And I don't, I don't mean to sound like some crazy person with a cardboard sign talking about the end is near. But recognize that it could come at any moment. And that should put a sense of urgency inside of us so that we recognize that, hey, we've got to get as many people as we can. Because that's what God calls us to do. To bring people into the family of God. Because if the righteous is scarcely, scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Folks, that should break our hearts. I pray, I hope that no one reads that scripture and says, yeah, that's what they deserve. I pray that no one reads this verse of scripture and says, serves them right. I pray that no one reads this scripture and says, that's exactly where they should be. Instead, I pray that we read this scripture and we say, God, help me get one more. God, let me, let me speak the truth to one more person. Let me proclaim your gospel to one more person. Just hold off just a little bit. Just tarry just long enough that one more could be brought into the family of God. And so he sums everything up here in verse 19. And really this could be a summary of the entire book. But specifically for this chapter in general, he says there in verse 19, Therefore let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Peter reminds us of what we need to do as Christians when we face suffering. And he's saying if we're suffering because we're doing the will of God, and as we've already said, sometimes suffering can be part of God's will, then we want to live our lives in such a way that when we do face that suffering, that it will bring glory to God. And while we're going through that suffering, we can entrust our souls to a faithful creator, to one who has not left us, one who has not forsaken us, one who, who this hasn't caught him by surprise, one who is there with us everywhere we go, who is standing right beside us with his hands outstretched, waiting for us to turn and dive deep into his presence. So how do we triumph in suffering? What should we do as Christians as we face this world? Well, first off, we, we should expect it. We should expect suffering. We should expect hardship. We should expect trials. We should expect tribulation. Jesus told his disciples, in this world, you will have tribulation. But he goes on to say, but be of good cheer. Don't fear. Don't worry. Because I have overcome the world. 
And so not only do, should we expect suffering, but we can rejoice in it. Why can we rejoice in it? Because Christ has overcome the world. That this momentary light affliction, as the Bible says, this, this small period of time where we face difficulty, this life where we have pain and hardship and death and all the things that we, we don't like to go through, this small period of time is nothing in comparison to what awaits us on the other side. And so we can rejoice knowing that our hope and our identity is not in this world, it is in Jesus Christ. But we also need to make sure that we're evaluating the source of our hardship and our suffering. Are we suffering because we are following Christ or are we suffering because we're being a meddler? Because we're being one of these other lists of things that have been mentioned there. Because we've forsaken the word of God, we've been disobedient and that has brought suffering. Again, don't automatically assume that because you're going through suffering that you're in the right. We need to evaluate the source of the suffering. And once we've determined that our suffering is because we are doing the will of God, we are following the will of God, then we need to entrust it into God's hands. Trust that he is a faithful creator. Trust that he will never leave us, that he will never forsake us, that he is right there with us wherever we go. And as we look over these passages of scripture. You know, Peter's not reminding us of suffering. He's not using this idea of judgment as, you know, to point fingers at Christians and saying, look how terrible you are. Look how sinful you've been. And now God's going to judge you and destroy you because of it. Instead, he said, look, we're facing a difficult time. We're going through great difficulty right now, but trust that God is with us everywhere we go. And trust that God is coming, that, that, that Jesus will return one day, that all wrongs will be made right, that everything will be as it should be. But until that day comes, we're going to trust in our faithful creator. We're going to follow him, and we're going to live our lives in such a way that is honoring and pleasing to him, and that brings others into the family of God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we, we give you praise for this day. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for those who have helped to be a part of our service today. And Lord, we pray that you bless them for that. I pray for each and every person that's watching today. Lord, I don't know their situation. I don't know what they're going through. I don't know the hardship that they're facing or whatever it may look like for their life. I don't know where they're at right now, but Lord, you do. You know everything about them. You know the ins and outs of every single person. You know our deepest, darkest sins. You know our joys. You know our sufferings. So God, I pray, Lord, for those especially who don't know you, who have chosen to reject you, who have turned their hearts away from you, that maybe somehow, Lord, today they've heard your word and they would turn their lives over to you. I pray for those who are believers, who are Christians, who are following your will, who are, who are trying to obey your word, who are living their lives according to what you've called us to do, and, but still facing that difficult time right now. I pray that you'd be with them, that they would recognize your presence. Pray for those who are suffering, who are hurting, who are struggling. Lord, help us as your as your followers to be your hands and feet. Help us to reach out and meet those needs when and where we're able. Lord, above all, let us glorify your name. And Lord, through that, through, our, through living our lives in the way that you've called us to live, may we share your gospel. May we shed your light on, on the dark world around us that just one more could come into the family of God. Lord, don't ever let us lose this sense of urgency. Don't ever let us lose this feeling that we have recognizing the, the loss of the, the things that we used to hold dear. Let us remember how, how we feel in this moment so that we would never lose sight of what's important. God, we love you and we praise you and it's in Jesus' name we pray. 
You know, suffering is never fun. None of us ever want to go through it. But the Bible tells us that we can have joy in our suffering because of the Spirit of God that lives inside of us. It is during our pain that drives us to depend on God. And when we, when we dive deep into his presence, that is where we find joy. No matter what is going on in the world around us, no matter what we may face, if our identity is in Christ, none of that matters. We can trust in our faithful creator because he is present with us everywhere we go and he will never leave us or forsake us. I want to encourage you today, regardless of where you are, regardless of the situation that you might be in, that you trust in the faithful creator. You trust in the God we serve. You turn your heart and life over to him. You turn your problems and your suffering over to him. Dive deep into his presence and find the joy that he promises. May God bless you.